Hi, my name's Tom Crouch. I'm the senior curator of aeronautics at the National Air and Space Museum. If you had been standing here on the National Mall on June 18th, 1861, you would have seen something a whole lot neater than me. A gas balloon, 55 feet tall, 30,000 cubic feet of lifting gas inside it, and a guy named Thaddeus Lowe who was about to go up into the air. Tethered to the ground, uh, all of Lowe's flights were tethered to the ground, uh, not free flights. Thaddeus Lowe at the time was one of the best known balloonists in the United States. He had made some really long flights. He'd flown all the way from Cincinnati to South Carolina, to the Atlantic Ocean. And once the Civil War began, he had written to Joseph Henry, who was the, the uh, secretary, the head of the Smithsonian. And he had, he had written to Henry before, asking him questions about science and so on. And Henry was interested in this guy, Thaddeus Lowe. So with the war beginning, Lowe invited, or Joseph Henry rather, invited Lowe to come to Washington and to give a demonstration of a balloon flight to show what you could see from 500 feet and to demonstrate the value of aerial reconnaissance, reconnaissance ballooning. People had actually been making reconnaissance balloon flights since 1794 when uh, the French made the first reconnaissance balloon flight during the Battle of Flores. But this was going to be something entirely new here in the United States. A couple of balloonists had tried to sell the Army on balloons just before Lowe did. But Lowe was the one who was going to make the real big splash. When he came to Washington, he immediately met with uh, Professor Henry, again the Secretary of the Smithsonian, and Henry was impressed. He took him right down to the White House, and they had an interview with Abraham Lincoln that very day in early June, 1861. Lincoln thought that the potential for, for reconnaissance ballooning was pretty bright. Lincoln was always interested in technology. In fact, to this day, Abraham Lincoln is the only American president who's ever held a patent. So he was fascinated by this stuff. The War Department gave the Smithsonian $250 to fund a demonstration balloon flight. And right here, where the National Air and Space Museum stands today, the Columbia Armory stood in 1861. It was the building where the District of Columbia stored its guns, its powder, black powder, ammunition, all of that kind of thing. And right next to it, in fact, just about where I'm standing, the Washington Gas Works stood. In those days, people were illuminating the city's street lights and that kind of thing with coal gas. They would uh, heat coal so as to produce a gas that could be used to illuminate street lights. And it too was a light gas, much lighter than air. So that's what Thaddeus Lowe was going to fill his balloon with. Usually, people fill balloons with hydrogen at that point. But coal gas was actually almost as good, and it was right here. So this is where Joseph Henry told Lowe to make his flight. Again, the day was June 18th, 1861. Lowe didn't go up by himself. He actually took a telegrapher with him. And in fact, the head of the telegraph company thought it was a really good idea, and he wanted to go up too. So three of them actually went up into the air that day, and they had a telegraph key. And uh, the telegraph line, they ran to where the telegraph line from Alexandria on its way to the War Department next to the White House came across the Potomac and they tied into it there. And there was another line going from the War Department to the White House. So from 500 feet in the air, Thaddeus Lowe literally sent President Lincoln a telegram talking about what you could see from 500 feet in the air. He said he could see for 25 miles in any direction. He could see the army camps around the city. And uh, it was the first time anybody had ever sent a telegram from the air. So pretty neat. They hauled the balloon down at the end of that, and they literally walked it down the mall and around the corner to the White House. Lincoln came out and uh, talked to Lowe, 
He was so fascinated that he invited Lowe into the White House. And in fact, Lowe says that he wound up spending the night in the White House that, time, that evening of June 18th because Lincoln just wanted to keep talking about the balloons. And in fact, Lowe says the next morning at breakfast, they kept talking about the balloons. And it was that, that impression that he made on Lincoln that really led to the creation of what he called the aeronautic core. It took a while after that uh, because the Army wasn't as crazy about this idea as President Lincoln was. And uh, Lowe would try to get in to meet with General Scott, who was the commander of the Army, Winfield Scott. And uh, they wouldn't let him through the door. He finally had to go back to the White House and literally get a note from President Lincoln, which we have in the collection at the National Air and Space Museum today, essentially telling General Scott to see this guy. The president was really interested in this. And so one thing leads to another, and the aeronautic core is created. Thaddeus Lowe was going to head the core. He had a group of balloons uh, manufactured up in Philadelphia. The balloon that he had flown here on the mall was called the Enterprise. And he used it for some of his operational flights early on uh, in, in June, July, 1861. But again, then he went up to Philadelphia and he had a string of balloons built. He hired some other aeronauts to operate them and the Aeronautic Corps was in business. They started out in the Washington area, basically, making flights from the forts around Washington, looking for the Confederates out in Northern Virginia. Uh, Lowe realized that he wasn't always gonna have the Washington gas works to fill his balloon up. So he actually designed what he called inflation wagons, big army wagons with, um, uh, metal bins on them that he filled with dilute sulfuric acid and iron filings and that generated hydrogen in the field that he inflated his balloons with. So when he was away from Washington, he could uh, generate his own lifting gas that way. They built those at the Navy Yard and in fact they also built an aircraft carrier for him, a uh, flat bottom barge called the George Washington Park Custis that had two inflation wagons on it, and they could move it up and down the Potomac, and Lowe made flights that way, again, looking con for Confederates down in, uh, down in Virginia. When the Peninsula Campaign started in 1862, Lowe and the balloonists went down to Fort Monroe, where uh, the peninsula between the York and the James Rivers began and the army was going to march north and capture Richmond that way, and the balloons went with them. They made a lot of flights during the Peninsula Campaign, and after that campaign, they flew um, at Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville in 1863, and after that, the balloon corps sort of fades away for a whole lot of reasons. But they had had a real impact while they were in business. And there were a lot of firsts. Um, the first telegram, as we said, sent from the air. Lowe did artillery spotting from the air. He cooperated with the Navy, uh, Navy gunboats out in the Western rivers, operating with balloons to do artillery spotting for them. And so it was really an interesting, neat experiment. Thousands of flights were made here in the east, as well as in the Western Theater and along the southern coastline. Lowe and Hughes aeronauts weren't the only ones flying the balloons. The Confederates, the Southerners, had balloons as well. Uh, the most famous one of which, called the Gazelle, was actually made out of bolts of dress silk, uh, patterned dress silk. We actually have a fragment of it in the collection of the National Air and Space Museum, and you can see the dress pattern where the pieces of fabric come together. It didn't operate very long, but uh, a good many famous Confederate officers uh, saw it and commented on it. And in terms of the northern balloons, Lowe, Lowe carried some of the most famous officers in the Union Army uh, into the air, from George McClellan, who was one of the early commanders of the Army, down to lower-ranking officers like 
George Armstrong Custer, for example, who was a cavalry lieutenant when he made flights with uh, the balloons and did sketch maps and that kind of thing. And the long-range impact of the ballooning was kind of neat, too. Americans um, didn't do a whole lot with it after the Civil War. But the Europeans, European officers, had been stationed with the Union Army and fascinated by this. And they went back to France and England and found the balloon operations there that became quite important in the second half of the 19th century. So the birth of American aerial reconnaissance and lots of firsts, and it happens right here in front of the National Air and Space Museum where we preserve the history of flight in America. So it's kind of neat that not only do we have a museum that preserves the history of flight, but flight was made right here on this spot.